this monitor speaker down here sounds like a boiling pot of oil. And it just continues to gurgle all the time. See, and I think it's gurgling and bothering you when it's really just gurgling and bothering me. But I think with that word, it got killed in the loft up there. I think they, so, glory. And you think about those who have died being boiled in oil and all of this, when all that's happening. I, I have this vivid imagination, and I have read so much about those who have gone uh, in the service of the Lord that uh, I sometimes let that get away from me when certain things like this are happening. Two weeks from today, we're there. It's Easter. And as we come into this time and think about what really happened, you know, part of our problem is that we so easily are lost in all of the trappings of the great religious holidays that it's easy for us as believers to miss the point. There's so much fault or all, there's so much going on that we fail to focus in as we should on the truth of what happened when Jesus Christ went to the cross. And as I've been thinking about that this week, thinking, where do we go? What do we do this week? I got into John chapter 10. I want you to go there with me for a little while. That's not the assignment for the week, but that's where we're going to be for a little while. And we begin in verse 8. And we see the dogmatism of Jesus. A lot of our attitude is that we do not want to be too dogmatic. We want to be very tolerant. We want to allow people to do whatever they want to do. I received in the mail this past week from uh, the Reverend Moon. You know the Moonies? I received a letter from him, and I received a package from him. I don't know how many pastors got one of these, but I received one. had in it three video cassettes and two books. And he sent these apparently to pastors all over America. I haven't met anyone else that got one, but I know he didn't just send one to me. Me and Br Brother Moon haven't met often. <laughs> Never yet to this point. But uh, there he is in prison in Connecticut for uh, cheating the government. And uh, it was interesting to watch the lineup of those who jumped to his defense. War and politics make strange bedfellows. And this was kind of a form of, of both. And there were all kinds of people that I have great respect for that somehow jumped in to defend this man and so on. And I, I sat around trying to figure out what really happened with all of this. And then I get this stuff from him in the mail. And the letter said... We need to bring all believers into unity together. Well, it sounded so good. If you didn't know different, you'd look and say, oh, isn't this swell? Guy got converted. And then as you read down the letter, he, he does what every cult always does. He uses all of the right lingo, all of the proper phrasing, up to and including, and I'm quoting him now, those of us who believe in a relationship with God through accepting Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. That's a quote from old Moon himself. But he's not fooling me. Because I understand how those work that want to pull you into their system. They'll take something that's very precious to me and use it as a means to pull me into the thing they're trying to share. And I know that ultimately they get down to where they're so far from the word of God, it's pathetic. We think a great deal about how tolerant we need to be. That means we don't need to punch the lights out of those that don't believe just what we believe. 
but we do not need to in any way allow ourselves to get to where we go along with those who do not deal directly with the Word of God and stay with Jesus Christ. And when you get into John chapter 10 and verse 8, Jesus said, I am the gate for the sheep. What dogmatism that is. All others who came before me were thieves and robbers, but the true sheep did not listen to them. Yes, I am the gate. Those who come in by way of the gate will be saved and will go in and out and find green pastures. The thief's purpose is to steal, to kill, and to destroy. My purpose is to give life in all of its fullness. You see the tremendous difference between the thief and the Son of God himself. His is to give life in all of its fullness. And the thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Satan operates as the thief. And you find him in the lives of people promising them everything. If they'll just follow him, it'll be wonderful. And he so pushes his facts that he deals in on people that they believe him and allow themselves to be separated from the truth of God and from the joy and delight and the fullness of life that there is in following Jesus Christ. And I think it's easy for us to get caught up in this process of just being kind and wonderful rather than to understand we have a message to declare and we need to be persistent in the declaration of that message until people finally come to the place where they are willing to hear the message. People come and sit here week after week after week and listen to the message, but it does not penetrate until suddenly they find themselves in a situation where they're finally willing to listen to the message. I sat with a man at lunch this Friday, and he's been here. And he and I have spent time together, and we've talked about the things of God, and he's vaguely talked about the fact that he believes there is a God. But Friday when we sat together, and he said, I'm at the end of my rope. I need what I hope and pray you can give to me. I need some kind of inner peace. See, up until now, he's always been able to say, I can accomplish this myself. And at that point, you have to get very, very narrow. You have to talk to people about the gate for the sheep. And Jesus went on to say, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd. There is only one good shepherd. You know, one of the most difficult things I ever do with people is look a man right in the eye and say, friend, you are either a child of God or you're a child of the devil. There are no other fathers. That's tough. You don't want to look a friend in the face and say, you're either a child of God or a child of the devil, and since you have never accepted Jesus Christ, you've never been born into his family, therefore you are a child of the devil. That's a good way to get punched in the mouth. Unless you are dealing so openly, and we don't like to do that. But if we ever get the cross into perspective and begin to understand what Jesus was doing there, then we begin to get under the pressure to understand that we must be very vigorous in our declaration of the truth that Jesus Christ is the gate he is the good shepherd. And the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. That's what he's done for us. I am the good shepherd. You see, a part of what he does as he declares that he is the gate and he is the shepherd, he claims the exclusive right to reconcile man to God. 
You know, if you're going to buy a franchise, you want to know what exclusive territory you're going to have. Can somebody else buy another one and move in next door? Folks in business don't just hope that doesn't happen. They put it into a contract and guarantee that it cannot happen. Now, a competitor can move in next door, but one of the same franchises cannot move in next door. Exclusive right. Jesus said, I have the exclusive right to reconcile men to God. There is no other way. And that's what the cross was all about. Someone had to die for the sins of people. Someone had to die as a substitute. And a part of, of what I believe is a problem inside evangelical circles, we have heard it and heard it and heard it so often that we become immune to it. We just, it just hits and, and bounces off and we have the notion that everybody understands that when the truth is most people do not understand that. I go to church, I'm a good person. I don't hurt anybody. And down goes the list of all the things that people say rather than to say, yes, that's true. I have never accepted Jesus Christ as my very own. I have never gone through him as the gate. I have never acknowledged him as the good shepherd. I have never acknowledged that the cross was really important for my salvation. Now part of the reason I know that I'm, I'm on a nerve here with believers, when our hearts begin to break over what Jesus Christ did for us in that great demonstration of love sufficiently that it affects the way that we live and it affects what we do with our time, our money, and our energy, and it affects what we do in the various areas of endeavor in getting the word of God out across this city and across this world. When that begins to happen, then we're beginning to get hold of the message. See, when Jesus talked about the selfish shepherds, and contrasted himself as the selfless one. A selfish shepherd, a hired man will run when he sees a wolf coming, will leave the sheep for they aren't his and he isn't their shepherd. And so the wolf leaps on them and scatters the flock and the hired man runs because he is hired and has no real concern for the sheep. But I'm the good shepherd and I know my own sheep and they know me and just as my father knows me and I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep. You see, the false teachers who come in some of the later writings in uh, 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 1 and in 1 Timothy chapter 4 verses 1 and 2, we have two kinds of the false teachers, the other shepherds who come. Listen to what it says about them. In, in 2 Peter chapter 2. He says there were false prophets too in those days just as there will be false teachers among you. They will cleverly tell their lies about God turning against even their master who bought them but theirs will be a swift and terrible end. Cleverly telling lies about God. That's what the Moonies are doing. And it it I guess the audacity that they would send something like that to me and think that I am so uh, poorly grounded in what I believe that they can run some video cassettes and send along a couple of books and they're going to suck me into their camp. 1 Timothy chapter 4. The Holy Spirit tells us clearly that in the last times, that's where we are, in the last times... Some in the church will turn away from Christ and become eager followers of teachers with devil-inspired ideas. These teachers will tell us lies with straight faces and do it so often that their consciences won't even bother them. 
That is happening all across this world today. And when we begin to get our focus on the cross and look at the ultimate selfless act of Jesus Christ giving himself for us, then it ought to pull our whole life into the proper perspective of saying, what is the purpose of my life? What am I doing and why am I doing it? Look in John, in, in John 10, 17 and 18. Jesus said, the Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may have it back again. No one can kill me without my consent. I lay down my life voluntarily, for I have the right and the power to lay it down when I want to, and also the right and the power to take it again. For the Father has given me this right. Don't ever look on the cross and think, poor Jesus. What a shame. What a shame that at the height of his ministry, they killed him. He pointed to that one thing, that he would lay down his life, for unless he laid down his life, there was no opportunity for us to be saved. And until we begin to get hold of that. See, some of you were so interested when Linda was singing, you can't be a beacon if your light don't shine. You were so interested in correcting the English in that song. You missed the message. See, if your really good grammar is operating, you don't say your light don't shine. Your light doesn't shine. it's so easy for us to be distracted and miss the message that we need to get hold of and when Jesus says here I lay down my life voluntarily he is right on target with what was written to us in Romans chapter 5 and I want to read you these verses and I want to assign you these verses for this week. Romans chapter 5, verses 6 to 11. Because if you get hold of these verses, if you begin to see yourself for what you were and what, you, what those are who are outside of Christ and begin to allow the love of God that came through the death of Christ to lay hold of you, there may be some movement on your part. Romans 5, verse 6, and I'm asking you this week to read verses 6 through 11 three times daily. That may mean you'll need to write them down on a little card and carry them with you. But morning, noon, and night, I'm encouraging you to think about what he did for us. When we were utterly helpless with no way of escape, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners who had no use for him. Even if we were good, we really wouldn't expect anyone to die for us, though, of course, that might be barely possible. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And since by his blood he did all this for us as sinners, how much more will he do for us now that he has declared us not guilty? Now he will save us from all of God's wrath to come. And since when we were his enemies, we were brought back to God by the death of his son, what blessings he must have for us now that we are his friends and he is living within us. Now we rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God, all because of what our Lord Jesus Christ has done in dying for our sins, making us friends with God. What a beautiful thing it is to know that you're a friend with God simply because of what Jesus Christ did and because you have accepted his death and his resurrection on your behalf to make you a friend of God, a child of God, to clean your slate, to give you the opportunity to go and live life on a level that is beyond any other level that anyone can ever imagine. 
And my prayer as I assign this to you is that in reading it three times a day from a half a dozen different translations that this message will get so into your life that you will allow it to begin to push you into some action. See, some of you aren't even saved yet. The most amazing thing to me is that folks can come and listen to the word and listen to the word. I, I talked yesterday to a lady who called me and said, my husband wants an appointment with you. He realizes he doesn't know the first thing about what it is to be a Christian. This man has been hanging around the church, whatever town he's lived in, he's been hanging around the church all his life. He doesn't know step one of what it means to be a Christian. That's his own confession. That's not me putting words in his mouth. That's what he told his wife to say to me. And in that particular move, of acknowledging where he is, there's hope for him that he might have an opportunity to come to Christ and to find his sins to be forgiven as we take this opportunity to get with him this week and open the word of God. See, the easiest thing in the world is to sit through service after service after service and all of it to go right over your head and never change your life because you never come down to the place to where you say, what a marvelous thing God did for me. What an unbelievable thing that Jesus Christ would get to a cross willingly and lay down his life. How great. And I want you to take that time to read that this week, three times a day. And see what would move upon you. As you allow the Spirit of God to take the Word of God and accomplish what needs to be accomplished in your life. Stand together with me as we pray, will you please? Father, it is impossible for us to fathom your love today. We think about the cross. We think about Jesus making an open statement here. No one takes my life from me, but I have the power to lay it down, and I have the power to pick it up again. Oh, the agony was real, that which Jan read to us out of the scripture this morning, the agony was real. The separation was real, for he carried our sins. And I pray that as the Spirit of God moves upon us as we read, Romans 5, verses 6 through 11, three times a day throughout this next week, that it'll bring this whole thing into focus for us. That we'll find ourselves alone with you, acknowledging how important it was for us that Jesus Christ went to the cross. And how important it is for us that our lights shine and that we are a beacon for the Lord how important for family and friends that they know how much we care about their eternal soul. We trust you, our Father, to accomplish great things through the reading and study of your word this week. Bind us close to yourself. Accept our thanks for all you've done for us. Prepare us for ministry. That's our prayer. We'll give you thanks. We'll give you praise. 
In the name of Christ, our Savior, we ask it. Amen. God bless you. Thank you so much. Be looking to see you around somewhere this week, but stay with Romans 5. Thank you.